Welcome everyone to Light on America in Laguna Woods. I'm here with Linda Kelling. I'm Pat Mycone, president of the Republican Club of Laguna Woods. And Ro Kendall, our VP of programs, could not be with us today, but she'll be joining us next month. So now, Linda, we are so grateful to have you back today. You gave us a lot of information last time, but we're here because we need to learn more about all these amazing, complex challenges. Thank you, Pat. Uh, I do miss Roe today. I'm sorry that she, wouldn't, she wasn't uh, able to be with us. Yep. But you're right. Last month, I gave you a lot of information mm -hmm. um, from all these housing mandates. Local control, obviously, was the, yes. the, the center of it all. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot more. And I'm glad you decided to separate this into two sessions. Because mm -hmm. today, I'm going to talk to you about what SB 9 is all about, SB 10. I'm, gonna over, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I did that last month. We're going to talk about CEQA. Okay. We're going to talk about the different uh, ways that a lot of these developments are approved. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about the solutions. Okay. And that's what's really important. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're going to ask me, how did we get here? Yes. You know, we've yeah. got to stop this runaway train of government overreach in mm -hmm. Sacramento. And as long as California has been a state, local governments have decided where housing will be or won't be mm -hmm. um, and how much to allow. I mean, look at all of these planned communities that we have. Voters have passed um, countless ballot initiatives, instructing their local gov governments on how to do that. You know, local jurisdiction is where the, the government, where government meets, uh, the rubber meets the road of mm. government, I should say. Mm. Um, because the residents of those communities are so closely aligned with their, with their uh, lawmakers. Yes, we know, and we know our community. Yes. Um, over the years, there's been, a, there's been obviously a need for, for more housing, but affordable housing. Um, and jurisdictions are now being strong-armed into planning for hundreds of thousands of, of mandated housing. Yes, like um, we got our new numbers in 997. Yes, we got our new numbers. Um, how the state came up with those numbers is really questionable. Um, they're based on Population projections. Well, you know where the population has gone over the last few years. And the sixth cycle of these RENA numbers, and again, I'll say what RENA is, it's the regional housing needs allocations. Mm -hmm. It's what comes down from the, the Housing and Community Development Department of the state, uh, how many numbers of housing we need, and it's allocated to all communities and, and, um, uh, and cities, uh, counties and cities. Okay. Um, but these numbers, it has been determined by the state auditor that these numbers are flawed. Um, they're irrelevant. It, it's, it's amazing how they continue to require this. Um, they know now what the state auditor said, but they're not going to change the numbers. It's yeah. still going to be the same. Wow. The, the Department of Finance said that there's going to be a, a flat population growth to 2031, and it's even going to be extended through 2060. So why? Why are we still being required to do yes, all this? That's a great question. Unfortunately, the <laughs> Housing and Community Development Department is not required to change these numbers. Guess who gets to do that? The state legislature. Are they going to do it? Absolutely not. Um, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that we are in this kind of predicament. Um, cities don't build the housing. Um, but under the state's RENA system, they have to identify areas. And if you don't have an area, you have to upzone those, those land, uh, plots of land. Mm. And I'll talk about what that all yes. means uh, later. You know, usually when growth changes are made, communities have a voice in it. Mm -hmm. It's not happening. Mm. Uh, the states are requiring us to redesign everything. And you hear about planning elements that are having to be drawn up. It's now requiring the cities to have more staffing in order to do that. Yes, they need consultants, whether legal consultants mm -hmm. or planning consultants, mm -hmm. to do this. Mm -hmm. They submit these plans to the, to the Housing and Community Development Department, mm -hmm. and they're either accepted or rejected. Mm -hmm. Many times, they're rejected. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what comes into play here is you've got developers that are watching this, because there is an, there is an item, and I didn't even know this until now. It's called uh, Builder's Remedy. If a community has not complied with the state within the period of time allotted, a developer can actually go in, has that property, buys that property, 
can build whatever they want and you have no say wow, over it. Wow, that's alarming. You know, the governor deemed this an emergency. Um, and of course, you know, I, I wish that the state legislature would work with local governments mm -hmm. because then they can find solutions that are reasonable. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many of the state legislators that are in Sacramento know what it's like in the communities of Laguna Woods here in Southern right. California right. versus what's uh, yeah. the communities up in Northern California? They yes. don't, yeah. yet they are passing these bills. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that local government is very important to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it should be important to all of you. Mm -hmm. Sacramento continues to usurp local control. Mm -hmm. And it bothers me because what's next? Yes. What is next? What yes. is Sacramento going to do to us next? Yes. And we should not be governed from the top down. Right. Um, government needs to work as partners and not be the overlords of yeah. us. Yes. Linda, last time you spoke about the Senate bills, and I recall you said um, two were passed two years ago, Senate SB 9, Senate Correct. Bill 9, and Senate Bill 10. Can you explain again more about that? Absolutely. Um, as far as SB 9 goes, I look at SB 9 as a Trojan horse. Mm. Something that will change the look and feel of our neighborhoods and communities forever. Residents will not have any notification or input about these changes. When the governor signed Senate Bill 9 and 10, most city council members might as well have gone home and become local citizens because their control over how their land planning was taking place was being taken over by the state. They had no control, absolutely no control. Um, but these two new laws allow six times as much building as before in areas formerly zoned for one home per lot. Wow. And even more units can be constructed in areas where there is rapid transit, where there are um, transportation corridors, bus stops, et cetera. Uh, you can have up to 10 units. Wow, I can't picture that somehow here in our village where we have, 50 years ago, we did a lot of planning and it was carefully planned, so. Well, a lot of this, uh, uh, the, there are no requirements for additional parking. There's, there's no additional infrastructure needs or money for schools, et cetera. It's all gonna fall in the laps of the residents of those communities. Mm. You know, I, I don't know, I just wonder, where's the money? Where's the money coming from? Yeah. Who's, yeah. Getting, who's getting rich over this? Mm. And I think people need to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. There are important questions to ask. Mm -hmm. People don't know what upzoning is. Mm -hmm. You just asked yes, what that I, was. I did not know. Um, it means that communities, it, let me put it simply, okay? If you live in a home in a, in a nice neighborhood, you bought that home after mm -hmm. probably living in an apartment for a few mm -hmm. years, you wanted to raise a family, so you went to this area. You saw all these nice homes mm -hmm. uh, dotted throughout this, mm -hmm. this community. Well, picture this. You've got your single home, mm -hmm. the house next to you. There's one house on that lot mm -hmm. and one house on the other lot. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes in and buys those two houses. They can put two duplexes on each one of those. Oh. Now they'll tear down those units. Now you've got a fourplex on each side of you. You've added more people, more cars, congestion. Again, the infrastructure needs and costs. Your neighborhood design takes on a whole new, different look. Wow. Now, let's go into the future on that. Mm -hmm. I told you about two single-family homes taken off the market. Mm -hmm. What happens to the inventory of single-family units? Prices go up. Because those, those, those other units that were put on those lots next to you are all rentals. Oh. Wait. They're all rentals. Why, why? Why would they be rentals now? Because that is where the need is. And that's oh. where the money is made oh. on the rentals. Is that part of the affordable? Maybe. Not necessarily. Mm. That's just it. Mm. Um, SB 9 is a lot splitting um, bill. Someone can come in there and split that lot mm -hmm. in half and put those duplexes in. They could even add an ADU or two. Mm -hmm. Those are rentals for the most part because people are going into rental units. They can't afford single family homes. SB 10 now is a different, is a different uh, structure. 
SB 10, again, is on usually transportation corridors. Mm -hmm. um, those are 10 unit apartments on a plot of land, usually within a, a half a mile from a transit hub or jobs rich area. Mm -hmm. People Meaning, can walk there. People can walk to work, et cetera. And again, these particular units, because they're on transportation corridors, do not require parking spaces by the developer. Wow. Now, interestingly enough, and I was, I was told this, that in the beginning when SB 10 was brought before the state legislature, there was language in it that suggested that it provided for affordable housing. Well, you know that when bills get introduced, they go to the second house and then they come back for, yeah. and there's all these amendments. Mm -hmm. By the time that bill was passed and signed by the governor, that language was taken out. Wow, the whole reason it started in the beginning. That's exactly correct. <laughs> but see, this is the state blames local agencies for not providing enough affordable housing. Yet, why did they take that language out? Hmm. Look, look, at the, look, look at what affordable housing is. These bills don't provide guidelines that distinguish affordable they housing. Don't? No, they do not. What is affordable is different from one county to another. What makes something affordable is driven by market rate. Hmm. A developer builds a multi family unit complex, a rental unit. All that building is because there's going to get, he's going to get market rate value mm -hmm. for those rentals. Mm -hmm. So what identifies them as, uh, there's a certain percentage that is set aside for affordable as designated yes. by the local yes. jurisdiction. Usually it's 20%. Okay. That's what it was in our community. Whenever mm -hmm. there was a housing unit, 20% had to be dedicated to affordable mm -hmm. housing. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So it's all market rate. Mm -hmm. Let's say all the units are at $3,000 a month rent. Mm -hmm. The affordable units are at $1,000 a month rent. Mm -hmm. Who pays that difference to the developer? Mm -hmm. Who subsidizes it? You know, what they are doing now is that a lot of these new units that are being built, the developer knows that a certain amount is gonna be set aside for affordable, mm -hmm. so those units are actually smaller. I wondered about that. I've seen that in some of the housing units in the yeah. community. Yeah, and that brings the cost of building mm -hmm. down a bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's, that's a good thing. But again, who pays, who subsidizes this? At one time, we had something called redevelopment agencies. In fact, our former governor, Jerry Brown, used redevelopment agency in the city of Oakland when he was mayor of Oakland, and he used that money to subsidize cleaning up downtown Oakland and reinvesting in those areas. That's where, that's where subsidi subsidizing came from. Oh, oh. Now, that was the engine governing it. Mm -hmm. So right now you've got nonprofits that are helping out to subsidize uh, for affordable housing, but these, these groups are running out of money. So what, can you give us an example of a nonprofit? Nonprofits? Mm -hmm. There's plenty of nonprofits mm -hmm. uh, in your area that will, will do this, and usually they're, they're associated with housing. Okay. Um, the, the one thing that is being talked about in the San Francisco Bay Area is floating a bond, a oh. bond measure that, who's gonna pay for it? Well, we are. The residents uh, yeah. of that area. Tax, taxpayers. Uh, but they wanna get a pot of money mm -hmm. so that that can be used to subsidize the affordable housing. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's another item that people don't know about. Anything that is considered affordable housing has a sunset clause. Now, usually that sunset clause has been 30 years. Now, I understand that it is being pushed up to 50 years. What that means is a housing unit that has been uh, designated as affordable is affordable for up to 30 years. Mm. As soon as that that sunsets, it goes back to market rate. Oh, I see. Okay, mm -hmm. so now you're losing affordable housing oh, units. I see. Um, bottom line on all of this, it should be local jurisdictions that mm -hmm. are dealing with this problem. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they build their communities, they know where they can put these things, additional housing, they, they know if they bring in more companies, uh, economically speaking, mm -hmm. they want to have people to be able to live there so they can walk to work, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. It's the residents that know what, how they want their, their communities to yes. grow. Yes. 
we chose to move here. Yeah, <laughs> for so, the reasons we have. So let me put it simply, what is at stake with SB 9 and mm -hmm. 10? Mm -hmm. It basically gives power to developers. Mm -hmm. um, it allows the lot splitting, mm -hmm. um, 10 units per lot for SB 10. Mm -hmm. Citizen uh, voted initiatives in those communities are null and void. That's shocking. I told you in the beginning That's that shocking. when communities are growing, mm -hmm. uh, they, initiatives were passed by the residents on how they wanted their cities to grow. Yes. Those will be null and void wow. through SB 9 wow. and 10. No public hearings. It's the end of single family dwellings as we know it. Uh, neighborhoods are gonna turn into dense multifamily uh, units. And I think the other item that has recently gone through both houses of the legislature is SB 423, which is now going to allow housing, high density housing along the coast of California. Wow. And anything that the Coastal Commission has put in place, rules and so forth for building along the coast, mm -hmm. will be overridden. Oh my heavens. Um, <laughs> It's, it's amazing how our state legislators, again, can pass such laws. Our coastline is beautiful. Why are we doing this? Well, especially since, we, like you said in the beginning, our population is going down. Yeah, but you know, California has always been the place to come to. Mm -hmm. The weather is beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, the land is gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this to our coastline? Right. Why are we gonna change this? Um, and speaking of these two bills, these are not the only two bills that have been passed. In fact, in the last year, from 2022 to 2023, 3,100 bills have been put forward to the state legislature. That's mind-blowing. It's not only mind-blowing. I, I, California's <laughs> broken. Yes. It's broken. Yes. And one man, one man mm -hmm. is spearheading all of this mm -hmm. in the name of his concern for the people. I would, I'm not gonna say I doubt it, but Senator Scott Weiner from San Francisco has been able to get these housing bills passed that he declares are all about the people, but none of these, with the amount of affordable housing that is within each development, they're not gonna magnify to the, to the growth to meet the needs of affordable housing in California. So why is he the only one that's doing this? Golly. That, that question is one that sticks with me too, Linda, as I'm following a lot of these laws that I'm seeing come out. I, I can't keep up with it, um, the laws coming out of Sacramento. <sighs> you can't because you, can't, you don't hear about all of them. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, you don't uh, hear about all of them. Yeah, 3,100, um, it'd be hard to hear about them all. You, you don't hear about all of them. Mm -hmm. And we're just talking mm -hmm. about housing. There's mm -hmm. a lot of other stuff that's going on that the public is unaware of. Wow. Linda, you spoke briefly about CEQA. We need to hear more about that. Simply put, CEQA is the California Environmental Quality Act. It is the environmental law. Its purpose is to foster transparency and integrity in public decision making when developments are being uh, put forth. Um, it was something that was put into law uh, during the term of uh, Governor Ronald Reagan's term. Oh. And it is a, it's a vital, uh, mm -hmm. process. Mm. Um, CEQA protects our environment. Oh, okay. Um, uh, it, it keeps the public involved, which is a very important part of it, where you can have people come in for meetings and so forth to discuss uh, alternatives to some of the housing mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. any kind of a development. Mm -hmm. uh, it triggers an EIR report, which is an environmental impact report. Mm -hmm. How does it affect uh, the community mm -hmm. regarding congestion management, you know, mm -hmm. cars, enough cars mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. But the legislator, legislators right now are considering alternatives to CEQA. They feel that CEQA is an old law, it needs to be streamlined, and in every bill that you take a look at of your housing bills, it says streamline CEQA. Oh. Why is that? Because CEQA does take a little bit of time, time is money, and so forth. But how are we gonna know how much water we need? How, what is the best land use uh, in our community? Um, what is the air quality going to be? How about the noise level? Uh, mm. Again, the infrastructure mm. needs. <clears throat> yeah. um, but they've been doing everything to streamline CEQA. In fact, they passed a, a law in 2021. It was SB7 and it was to streamline CEQA. 
Uh, right now, there's a new one um, in the assembly, AB 1449, which is going to further uh, streamline CEQA. Wow. Um, and it, it's, it's when you're trying to be, if you're trying to be concerned about the environment, you don't want to streamline this. Now, there are many things, other ways that developments are approved. There's another process, and it's called ministerial approval. And you're going to see that most of these bills right now are being approved ministerially, meaning it's a rubber stamp. Wow. Um, if it, um, now obviously it has to, conf any building has to conform with, with uh, certain codes and everything, mm -hmm. but it basically takes away any of the input from the local citizens and it gets projects approved very quickly. Wow. Um, developers know this and so it, it, it moves very, very quickly. Um, this is overwhelming, don't yes. you think? Yes, yes, Linda, it is. It is. So what can we do? I mean, we, we, we had your first session, which we learned a lot. We've learned a lot more in this session. So now, what can we do? I think that every community can plan the allowable affordable housing that is going to be needed. Mm -hmm. um, they know how to, have, how to plan the growth of their community. Mm -hmm. The community I, I moved from is four square miles. The bay is on one side, there are two cities on the other. Uh -huh. I think we know how yes. we can plan for any additional housing. Mm -hmm. um, there's a richness to life brought on by a mix of housing units, whether it's single family dwellings, in homes in, neighbor, in our neighborhoods, whether there's apartments, townhouses, duplexes, et cetera. You have that going on in Laguna Woods, I believe. Yes, we do. <laughs> Again, I think the key question for the people is how can our legislators upzone the entire state of California and yet require no infrastructure upgrades, no funding for it? This is all unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. So what are the solutions to stopping this runaway train that we call the current Sacramento leaders? Well, instead of disrupting our neighborhoods, how about incentivizing the development of underutilized commercial corridors, huh. such as your strip malls? And I have a picture okay. of one that we okay. can put on our, our session here. Mm -hmm. Those can be mixed-use developments. You build, um, you build um, businesses on the bottom and housing right on top. Mm -hmm. If it's right next to a, mm -hmm. a transportation corridor, all the better. Mm -hmm. What about revolutionizing transportation? There are smaller communities in areas of California that could bring in the employees that are needed for many of the, of, of the big corporations. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably talking about more of Silicon Valley. Yeah. There's much more affordable housing land beyond the Bay Area, mm -hmm. just like down here in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So why don't we have a better structured transportation system to move people around? Mm -hmm. We don't have that. <clears throat> um, we're dealing with bad unfunded housing mandated bills, but there are more solutions available. And here's what we can do. Okay. Um, we need to place a ballot initiative for next year's election in mm -hmm. 2024. And it was something called uh, our Neighborhood Voices, which is a, a group of, of nonpartisan, um, it's a nonpartisan group. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was the uh, mayor uh, of uh, Redondo Beach yes, that helped draw this up, <coughs> this initiative up. And it will protect local control for the future. Um, uh, no, other nonpartisan groups that are working to inform and educate the general public about this catastrophe that's happening in California are catalysts from uh, Marin County, Livable California, Citizens for Local Control out of Torrance. Wow. Wow. They're all trying to inform and educate the general public. That's encouraging. The Southern Cal to bring things local to home mm -hmm. here, uh, mm -hmm. the Southern mm -hmm. California Association of Government, better known as SCAG, mm -hmm. voted overwhelmingly to support our Neighborhood Voices campaign. Oh, wow. They need money so we can get these, we can get the, um, <clears throat> We can get uh, signatures on the ballot, mm -hmm. so we can get this on the ballot next year. Supporting this initiative would give communities the ability <coughs> to override any further new state laws like SB 9 and 10 mm -hmm. in the future. Uh, there's a lawsuit right now against SB 9, and this lawsuit was put together uh, for some of the charter cities here in California. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, they had a court date about two weeks ago in the Los Angeles oh. courts. And there was some positive 
feeling from it. But anything can happen, of course. Yes. Um, but it's going to be heard again. So mm -hmm. more information on that to follow. Okay. Currently, there. Um, uh, now, you know what? I want you to remember these names. Mm -hmm. I can talk all day about this, Pat, as mm -hmm. you know. Yes. But I want the people to, to know and share these names of the lawmakers in Sacramento that are basically making this happen. Look at the bills. Look at who's authored them. Look at who's co-authored them. Senator Scott Weiner of San Francisco. Buffy Wicks of Oakland. Dave Cortese of San, San Jose. Tony Atkins and David Alvarez from the San Diego area are the key authors and co-authors of many of these housing bills mm. that seemed, and seem to get them through very readily and passed and signed by the governor. So who's controlling California's destiny? The residents? You know, our nation is polarized, Pat, and we're, yeah, we're dysfunctional we in many ways. Yes. But one of the best examples of this chaos is California's many housing laws passed and the various developments under consideration to address our affordable housing crisis. These laws have been taken away from local land use controls and from all of the cities in California and given to the developers. You know, Thomas Paine, in his pre-revolutionary mm -hmm. war pamphlet, Common Sense, mm -hmm. spiked a serious debate mm -hmm. about the erosion of citizens' rights. Mm -hmm. And he was instrumental in shaping our nation. At this critical time in history, we need a Thomas Paine yes. type of dialogue yes. uh, on the pros and cons of different approaches to addressing not just affordable housing, but other things like mm -hmm. sustainability, climate change, uh, energy independence, et mm -hmm. cetera. Yes. We need to all be vigilant about yes. the bills coming down from Sacramento. You need to ask questions of your council members. Yes. Ask questions of your state legislators. Who's controlling this? What's their goal? Um, we are tasked with this. I know there's a lot going on in our lives, mm -hmm. but we need to stay vigilant. Um, the current majority in the legislature in Sacramento seems to be looking at one size fits all and governing from the top down. That will not do. The state is passing draconian laws. We need a common sense approach to governance. Remember, government has a way of creating the problem and then trying to sell you the solution that they want. If you continue to vote for the same people, expect the same results. It's going to happen. What did Ronald Reagan say? Didn't he say the, let's see, the, the nine? The nine words that were. That we don't want to hear or that we beware the of. The knock on the door is the person saying, I'm from the federal government and I'm here to help. <laughs> and this is what the state legislature in California yes. is doing. And it's destroying California. Linda, thank you so much for your time, your talent, your dedication to this. You've opened our eyes and opened up many conversations I know that we'll have in the future. And I, I know myself, I'm gonna be more involved in my community, in the city council and what's going on. And I dare say, I hope our, our, our um, listeners out there will do the same. It's a matter of educating, conversing with one another yes. and informing. Yes. We've gotta get the word out. Yes. And, and it's happening. And awareness, it starts with awareness. We need common sense lawmaking to protect our constitutional amendments. So I want to thank Paul Ortiz and the team at Channel 6 today for allowing us to have this program, and especially our producer, PJ Higgins, who's doing a fabulous job. I also want to say if you have any comments and you questions, please email us at lightonamericalw at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you'll see us next time.